Good morning to everyone. It's a beautiful day. I have a few announcements to start off with. One is Jean Bink is doing much better. And the announcement, our worship display this morning, um, the one on the right is from Robert Service, and the one on the left is a gift from Al-Anon. Did I get the right and left correct on the stage? Okay. <laughs> so that was very nice of them to do. Uh, makes them a really nice display. And then, um, Robin, I'm going to have you come up. And I also want to say there's no prayer meeting this coming Wednesday. After Robin's done, I'll do the call to worship. So if any of you realize that we had a whole bunch of yarn back here, we had collected yarn for the knitting group, and after we started having yarn come in, I never saw the lady again. And um, just last week, Ron says, can we get rid of this yarn? I said, no, no, I am confident now the weather is turning cold, I'll see her again. So yesterday, this gentleman came, and he's carrying a bag of food, and we're chit-chatting, and he mentioned something about knitting. I said, is your wife one of the knitters? And he says, well, I don't know really what you're referring to, but yeah, she knits, and she knits in a group. And I said, I have got yarn for you. And so he took the yarn. He's very grateful. And about a half hour later, here comes the knitting lady. And I am so excited. She brought this bag full of hats. And I'm just going to show you a couple. Isn't that just the cutest? Just the cutest. And she said that her donations of yarn, all they had left was white. And they were so grateful for this donation of yarn. We had a boatload. It was a lot of yarn. Because you guys were so generous. All I have to do is put out the word and... Here it comes, and so I'm so grateful to you and your donation, and she was just overwhelmed, and she almost, she had tears in her eyes. She was so excited that they needed so desperately that donation of yarn. So I'm going to put out the word again, and um, when you're at Walmart or wherever you guys go to the craft store, if you could pick up a couple skeins of yarn, they really appreciate it. And um, also, one more thing. Oh, here's another one. Isn't that cute? Um, there are papers like this back on the table, and I thought that, oh, and um, I thought it would be very helpful because it's a letter from the Center for Hope thanking us, not us, but every, it's not a letter just to us, it's to everyone, you know, that supports it, and, but it has a list of things that they're asking for here. Also, on the inside, it talks about their Christmas thing that's coming up and suggestions for that in sizes and, and gender and so on and so forth. I thought it really had great information. And so I invite you to pick up one of these. Um, I put them on the table here, and I think I put them on that table that's by the chair. So I'm trying to catch everyone to, to get a copy of the um, wish list from the Center for Hope. And I want to thank everyone so much for all your, your support for these people. It's a, it's a wonderful work that we are assisting them in doing. She reminds me of Santa for some reason. <laughs> Carry that bag. I'm just going to read for our call to worship, Psalm 34. Verses 1 through 4. I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. My soul shall make her boast in the Lord. The humble shall hear, therefore, and be glad. O magnify the Lord with me, and let us exalt his name together. I sought the Lord, and he heard me, and delivered me from all my fears. O oh Lord, our Heavenly Father, we do come together this morning as thankful people. 
And we aspire always to be a thankful people, knowing and recognizing the blessings that you provide for every one of us, for all of us together, and for people throughout the world because of your love, your care, your generosity. And so we come here this morning to spend another hour together in recognition of your love, your care, and your blessing. And we pray that you will help us to be thankful throughout all this time that we are together and beyond when we return to homes and elsewhere throughout our lives. Thank you for being our God. And we pray these things. It's significant and commemorative that the candle is already lit for this service. In the name of Jesus Christ, all are welcome to this sacred space. We are called to, this is a quote, above all else, strive to be faithful to Christ's vision of the peaceable kingdom of God on earth courageously challenge cultural, political, and religious trends that are contrary to the reconciling and restoring purposes of God. Pursue peace. That's from Doctrine and Covenants 163.3b. Listen to the voice that invites you to surrender your fears frustrations, anger, and anxieties. Wait with an open heart the peace that only Christ can bring. Allow the one who seeks only the best for you to offer the comfort you seek. Please bow in prayer with me. Dear gracious and loving God, today we lift our hearts and prayers in the pursuit of peace. May your light and compassion be spread to others through us, your humble servants. Guide us to be loving to all your creation. Open our hearts so that we may help those who are victims of injustice. Let those who are hurt feel your presence and know that they are loved. May your peace and love flow through us in this time. May we be shalom throughout your creation. We ask this in your most holy name. Amen. There's a, a power and energy about live music, and it, when you go without it, then you realize how important that is. And the you know the bells this morning were a good example of that. And some of the people I follow on social media have been getting out back to shows, whether they're in California or wherever, and it said the exact same thing that there's just nothing like a live performance, and. You know, I love music and I love comedy, and both of those are things that are enriched by being together. We need each other. Um, I went to a comedy show just Thursday night, and afterwards, my friend I went with, he said, we laughed solid for the last 20 minutes. And if you were watching that show on Netflix, you, it wouldn't be that, where your face hurts because the, you're laughing so hard. So it's, it's good that we're, I know we've been saying this for a little while, that we're getting back, we're getting back, but it's, it's good to be back in with a live performance. So thank you guys. And, and getting prepared for Thanksgiving, you know, there's the, the autumn pictures on here and people going shopping this weekend. And I, I will tell a story that has really nothing to do with anything except it's a good story. So yesterday I was doing the leaves and 
I blow them all to the center and then I use the mower to go over them and chop them all up. And I had a pretty good sized pile, probably a little bit longer than for me to rock sand. And part of it was on the driveway, part of it was in the grass. And uh, it was pretty tall and I drove through it with the mower. I've got Ron's old um, 36 inch Gravely, if Ron's on interwebs. Um, so he knows the mower. And I go through the pile thinking I was gonna push it, but it just went over the top of it. And the muffler gets ridiculously hot. So I'm like, well, is it gonna blow off? And it started on fire. I'm like, ugh. So I, my first thought was the hose is right there, the leaf blower is over here. Uh, I went and grabbed the leaf blower and blew off the mower. And, Cause it was, I mean, truly on fire. And I, I was worried about the gas tank on the mower because it's plastic and it's got three and a half gallons in it because I just filled it up. And gas is pretty volatile. So I was a little bit worried about that. Got that out, ran back to the backyard to get the a metal rake because I knew a plastic rake wouldn't help me. So, and then I come back and the flames are huge and the smoke is huge. And I, I separate the, you know, I make a, a space between the burning stuff and the rest of the pile and it's just going and going and going. My neighbor comes out, Will you, what's going on? I'm like, ah, I think I got it under control. Um, on the plus side, I didn't have as many leaves to rake or bag up, <laughs> but it was huge smoke. And then my other neighbor came home and I, I went over and told him, I said, this is an accident, I didn't mean this for happening. He said, I thought you were just tired of bagging. I'm gonna burn them and get them. Um, there was a big black stain on the driveway now, because it was, I mean, the circle was, huge and it was hot to even rake it away it was so hot so um yeah that's my little story that you know, means nothing you know just a story um so it's good to be here and, and and hopefully i've got something to say with this um the scripture is john 18 33 through 37 and this is about um the kingdom of God, and where is the kingdom of God? Pilate then went back inside the palace, summoned Jesus and asked him, are you the king of the Jews? And Jesus said, is that your own idea? Or did the others tell you about me? And then Pilate snottily says, am I a Jew? Your own people and the chief priests handed you over to me. What is it that you have done? Pilate asked. Jesus said, my kingdom is not of this world. If it were, my servants would fight to prevent my arrest by the Jewish leaders. But now my kingdom is from another place. So you are a king then, Pilate said. Jesus answered, you say that I am a king. In fact, the reason I was born and came to this world is to testify the truth Everyone on the side of truth listens to me. So this is a very personal conversation between the worldly power and the earthly power. I mean, it's a collision of God's kingdom and kingdoms on, of the world. Jesus didn't use political rhetoric here. I mean, you could have, he could have spun it where he leaned into Pilate and said, do me a favor. Why don't you crucify me? Because I'm supposed to die and this will just make everything easy. But he's established a division, a line, and said, this is where my power is. My power is from God. It's not from here. He was also proclaiming an end to the power and glory of worldly leadership and a rise of a new order. The ones who handed Jesus over to Pilate were expecting Jesus to be the guy to fight him and the guy to represent them and change their lives in a worldly way. They were hoping that he would square off with Pilate. If you, are, if you are the Messiah, they mocked, come down off that cross. But Jesus wasn't that kind of a ruler. And before we scrutinize all those guys for 
handing them over to Pilate, probably we should look in the mirror because we too have had trouble recognizing leadership for us. For a, the kingdom calls for a power under the people instead of a power over the people. It demands a rejection of the methods of the kingdoms of this world. And the nature of God is not win by killing. When we look back at our recent history, and recent meaning U.S. history, maybe we remember 55, 40 year fight. I mean, that's like the perfect example of we're, you know, let's fight to win, to kill instead of love one another. The Polk used that to take the western part of the U.S. from Britain and it was a rally cry for everybody. I remember learning that in grade school and thinking, hey, we, we were pretty cool, we were bad. We went in there and took it. But is that really what we're supposed to do? Are we supposed to just go in and take things? And I think we confuse these necessary evils with our own personal duty of a personal duty and what's right, and we're too quick to pick up the sword instead of pick up the cross. Um, a couple weeks ago, a friend of mine came down with COVID, and I was kind of worried about when I heard that, and he was spiraling down, and now he's in the hospital, and I'm kind of the, because of, well, I know this guy better than this group of friends know him, but we all know him, and so I'm kind of the reporter to the other group. And everybody's, oh my gosh, you know that. Um, at the same time, there, my friend was not vaccinated because in his own words, I'm not scared of COVID. And now he's on oxygen in the hospital. Um, and all of that group of friends know that his view on the issue. And there's, they, were glib about him being in the hospital. And it kind of stung, you know, like, this is my best friend. And I don't agree with what he's doing, or his decisions to be vaxxed or not vaxxed. And, and it's a person. And you guys are making it about the wrong things. And they knew it. They knew they were being mean, but it was safe because it was in our little friend group. Um, and then just the other day, a friend said, did I go too far with that joke? And I'm like, eh, a tad. And he apologized profuse, profusely. And I said, you know, you don't need to apologize. And he said, I do because if I made you uncomfortable, if I crossed the line, that needs to be addressed and we need to work through that. So I was very appreciative of that. Now my friend is turning the corner and may come home. Um, he's got little girls and for a couple days I didn't hear from him because I didn't, he just was too sick to text. and. My, you know, my heart went out to him and his little girls. And before he went to the hospital, he's like, I just want to go hug them. I can't hug them because I've got COVID and they can't come around me. And then I thought, is he even going to get a chance to do that ever again? And, and then it, this is a bigger, a small example of a bigger situation where we're too quick to remove the person from the human from our own view and, and from the, the other side's view, uh, whichever side you're on. And it's a good example of follow what Christ is saying. My kingdom is not win by killing. It is by love. 
So Jesus responds to those who wanted him to go into battle. And he says, he called them together and said, you know that those who are regarded as the rulers of the Gentiles lord over them and their high officials exercise authority over them. Not so with you. Instead, whoever wants to become great among you must be your servant. And whoever wants to be first, wants to be first must be slave of all. For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. And that's from Mark. And that's the perfect answer to the guys that want to say, go fight him, go do your thing, go be tough for us. And it's about serving other people. And when you put yourself in the role of taking care of anyone who's sick, whatever the ailment may be, or had surgery, you have much more empathetic view when you serve people and come from the, the bottom up leadership. He also said, I am not an earthly king. My kingdom is not of this world. That was in John. Um, and in Matthew, the devil comes to Jesus and says, if you are the son of God, tell these stones to become bread. Bread represents food. It represents provisions for the Israelis, Israelites at that time. Jesus will later say, I am the bread of life. And bread was an essential part of their diet. And you can see that the devil was tempting him with providing for his people, for one of the things that a leader should do is how are, you know, how are you going to sustain your people? Christ answers that question by saying, well, Jesus' response should not be seen as a, re a rejection of solving the problem as an earthly king would. He doesn't ignore the physical needs. He simply chooses to address the matter in a way, in a different way. He relates to the hunger of all people all over the world. He doesn't choose to alleviate their pain. He embraces it. The kingdom of God is much bigger than a loaf of bread. It is more than food. Jesus replies, man does not live on bread alone but on every word that comes from the mouth of God. Jesus kind of refused to feed the people in their, and ease their temporary suffering by giving them things, but he called them to the kingdom of God at the same time because it's bigger than these little things that we're worried about. Then the devil took him to the holy city and stood him on the highest point in the temple. If you are the son of God, throw yourself down. But Jesus doesn't parachute in and rule over the temple. Again, the devil, uh, I'm gonna skip that part and just go to the next one. The devil took him to the very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their splendor. I will give all of this to you if you will bow down and worship me. Jesus is faced with economic leadership questions, with religious leadership questions, and with political questions. And he's face to face with the devil. He redefines his rejection of earthly kingship and rejects the avenue of earthly politics to advance the kingdom of God. He chooses a power under strategy, 
if you want to call it a strategy. Because these methods represent the character of God. We often are quick to pick up the sword these days, even against our neighbors. Now let's look at, I'm going to use the example of sports and specifically football because I can't go standing up here without talking about football. Um, you know, we all have our favorite teams and we put the sticker on our car and the flag in our yard and we cheer for our team. And we also cheer against the other team. Um, you know, we love it when Tom Brady loses and we love it when Tomlinson of Pittsburgh loses. And everything our team does is right. And we don't agree with the things that, you know, we, we have opposition with the other team. Um, but if we look at that from the NFL owner's view, which is a much different viewpoint. Um, you know, the NFL doesn't have the biggest viewership of sports in the world. You know, soccer, you know, we brag on the Super Bowl for having 200,000 people or two, 200 million people watch the Super Bowl. But yearly, twice a year, when Barcelona um, and they play in the Classico, who I, uh, they play another team. It's kind of my, sorry? No, not really. Anyway, the two teams play, and every viewing of the 300, um, 3 billion people watch that game every year, and that's just a regular season game. Much more people watch soccer. So soccer should be the most valued monetary league on the planet, but football is. Soccer has the top teams who have all the money, and the little teams who do not. Football kind of used to be that way, but they realized that I'm only here because of the Dolphins and because of the Seahawks. All of us together create what we are, and I need you and you need me. So that everything is very even-ish in the NFL. And they, so the owners view their teams and the league much differently from the fan. Even the players view each other as brothers. There is a brotherhood, you know, the NFL alumni. Um, they know that it's hard to get to the NFL. And they know that it's hard to be good in the NFL. And those that achieve, you know, at the end of the game, you see the guys hug each other and say stuff to each other, and you think, eh, that's just for show. But it really isn't. Those guys respect each other, and they know that without you across the line from me, I've got nothing. Von Miller, a couple years ago, he played for the Broncos, now he's with the Rams. Um, I don't remember, I think it was when he won the NFL MVP. Um, he had special bottles of wine made or champagne maybe, um, not to congratulate himself, but to congratulate all the other players at his position in the NFL. And he gave them to, had them sent out with a nice note that said, and I'm totally going from memory, that we are a special, are a special group when we go through the same things and if I couldn't have this award without you guys doing this, you know, being in your position and working hard and raising all of our talent levels. Um, so that's a player on another team giving another player on another team a pat on the back, a, a reward for being the opposition. Now, you could, in all these examples I've been talking about with the NFL, you could put that in our politics today, plant that on top of there, and, and let that simmer in your head. The, the NFL teams and players need each other, and there's a love for each other and a respect. And even though they want to beat the other guy, 
They know that they have to survive with them. That's a big lesson for us today, is we're so in the removed, you know, we're these little tiny guys compared to the, the big picture of the NFL. Broaden our viewpoint and see that everybody is important and everybody has their own view and their own way of doing things that has merit. If the Chiefs, you know, we, we think everything they do is great, and then at the beginning of this season, uh, we're not doing so great. It's, and everybody, talk radio was talking about canning this guy and firing Andy and you just, you know, cleaning house. When it's, that's such a, a, a narrow viewpoint to view things through. When we, because the other teams studied us and looked at how we were doing things, they learned and got better. If we're willing to look at the other side and see the value in what they have and get better because of what they bring, whether it's if they're Jewish or Buddhist or Muslim, what do they have that has value for us all? Because it's, we're all in this together. That's what Jesus was saying by, my kingdom is not of this world, it is of the kingdom of God. No one can serve two masters. This is from Matthew. Either you will hate the, one, hate the one and love the other, or you will be devoted to one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. What good will it be for someone to gain the whole world, yet forfeit their soul? Or what can anyone give in exchange for their soul? And I'm always reminded of the, um, when I hear that scripture, um, that scene in O oh Brother Where Art Thou, when they pick up the, the guy that just sold his soul to the devil to play the guitar, and the little guy in the back says, oh son, for that you gave your everlasting soul? It just, that's a funny line. But I think about what do we give our self to? That's Jesus's point, and that's really what God's trying to tell us, is what do you give yourself to, what is the kingdom of God, and how do you spend your time, and more importantly, your thoughts, in where you want to see us progress. So as we go through the week, as we go through our days and minutes, think about the bigger picture and what the other side has to offer. And think about, you know, I do it, because when my friend was first diagnosed, I have to admit that part of me thought, good, you deserve this. What an evil, evil thought. And I'm embarrassed by that, because nobody deserves that. Approach it from a viewpoint of an NFL owner who needs everybody. Because if we do need everybody. And our view, as important as it is to us, is probably wrong. And the other guy is probably wrong. But if we come together, we can learn and find a right way. So that's my message. I hope it made some sense. Um, thank you. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, we come to you as a group of people, your disciples, to give thanks that as we have just sung, 
to give thanks to you for being the God of our creation, the God who loves us, the God who continues to provide for us the things that we need in our lives. We're grateful for the opportunity we have to come together, to be together this day. We're grateful for all of the ways in which you bless our lives from day to day, in which you call us by the blessing of your spirit as it comes to us, as it shares in our lives from day to day. And we come now to recognize not only your love and your care and your generosity in giving to us, but also to recognize the opportunity we have to return in gifts, to return your love, and to share it with others as we do so with our tithes and our offerings this morning. And so we ask your blessing as we do that. May we uh, always remember that uh, what we give is the product of what you have given us and that we have the opportunity always to know of your love and to share. And so we pray your blessing now as we share, as we go from here, as we give our offerings this morning. And we pray it all in Jesus' name. Amen. I want to take a few minutes to give thanks for the participants in this service. Each of you did a wonderful job. Imperfection is perfect to me. And great kindness to yourself is what you should give to yourself. I admire each of you for coming here today to participate in God's kingdom. I want you to take this walk together, remembering to give, to give forgiveness, to walk in hand with one another, giving support, and to still Brian's word, pick up your cross and share your love with others. Please pray with me. Dear Lord, we thank and praise you for the life you have so richly given us. Thank you for the incredible blessing of being your sons and daughters, for the intricate and beautiful creations you have made us to be. Lord, we give and ask that we might engage with you and your spirit this coming week. Amen. <laughs>